Hi, so I'm Chris from the band Turbo Wolf. I'm joined with Blake and Andy from the band as well. We're here in the historic and epic looking Roman baths of Bath. And we're here to talk about our mutual interest in all things unexplained and um, ancient. And luckily enough, we're joined with one of the most prolific and knowledgeable writers in this subject the author of uh, books such as The Sign and the Seal and Fingerprints of the Gods, Mr. Graham Hancock. Hi. Good to Hi. be with you. Good to be with you. Nice to have you here. Yeah. So um, just like to start off by maybe if you could tell us about how you got onto this path of uh, researching ancient civilizations and ancient history. Yeah. Well, like uh, just about everything that's happened in my life, it was an accident, really, uh, a set of circumstances. I used to be a journalist. I was the East Africa correspondent for The Economist, and I was based in Nairobi, in Kenya. And on my beat was uh, Ethiopia, uh, which I used to visit regularly. This was during the early 80s, and it was a time of war and a time of famine. And uh, during these cataclysmic events, I found myself in an ancient city in northern Ethiopia called Aksum. Uh, in the grounds of a cathedral, a very ancient Christian cathedral called St. Mary of Zion, in which there's a little chapel. And in front of that chapel, I met a monk who wouldn't let me go inside. Uh, and when I put it through the translator, why couldn't I go inside? He explained that they had the Ark of the Covenant in there, as in right, Raiders yeah. of the Lost Ark. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, what? You know, can you be serious? And he said, yes, I, I am serious, actually. We do have the Ark of the Covenant here, and nobody's allowed to see it, not even the Emperor. Well, I thought he was pulling my leg, but I, I started to investigate it, and I found that, actually, it's the whole basis of Ethiopian culture that they claim to have this object. I also found that academics dismissed the notion and thought that it was just a fantasy that they'd, that they'd made up. But there was something about the arrogance and rigidity of the academics that really annoyed me. And I thought, let's just see if we can stand this story up. Let's see what the Ethiopians are on about. And I began to investigate it over the years. And as I did so, I began to realize that they did have a case and that they really could have that amazing lost object, the most, uh, you, you know, the most mysterious object of the Bible could be sitting in this chapel in the highlands of, 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 of Ethiopia. And that's what led me down the track of, uh, of investigating ancient mysteries. That was the first book I wrote about an ancient mystery. It was called The Sign of the Seal. It was eventually published in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, one of the notions that came out on that was that the Ark of the Covenant, which, I, I mean, the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark actually plays it right. It really did, according to the Bible, strike people dead with bolts of fire, would rise up into the air and rush towards the enemies of, uh, of Israel. When the Philistines opened it, they were struck down with cancerous tumors. You know, it sounds like a piece of technology. Absolutely, it sounds yeah. like radiation or something, mm -hmm. yeah. something like that. So I began to wonder, could there have been lost technologies in ancient times? And, the research for that book, one of the places it took me to was Egypt. I found myself in front of the Great Pyramid. I found the same arrogant, narrow-minded academics saying, no, this is just a simple piece of primitive technology, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that they thought such a thing. Six million tons, 480 feet high, 13-acre footprint, perfectly aligned to true north, south, east, and west. It appears out of nowhere at the beginning of Egyptian history, and they said they've got this whole problem solved. So again, I wanted to give the opposite point of view, give the alternative point of view, and that's what led me into looking for, for a lost civilization. Really. Yeah, absolutely, and I mean, um, I think that leads us into our, on, onto our next question, which we want to talk about um, why, uh, you know, mainstream uh, ancient historians uh, want to keep, um, you know, their, their, this certain viewpoint, um, you know, out there, rather than trying to ac accept a different, a different viewpoint. Yeah. On it. I think that, um, f first of all, I want to, I want to pay tribute to, to mainstream historians and, and archaeologists um, at, at one level, uh, which is that these are, uh, I believe, fundamentally honest, thorough, hard-working people who get their hands dirty in the sand, in the earth, digging up artifacts from the past. Um, I think when they say there's no mystery in the past, they themselves genuinely believe that. I don't think that they're trying to pull off a con trick on the public. But I do think that, um, that they are locked into a particular mindset, and that mindset is the evolutionary mindset that sees our society as the apex and the pinnacle 
of the human story, a sort of evolutionary process, you know, from primitive cavemen through a gradual development into agriculture and then down into Roman times, the Greeks and the Middle Ages, and, and finally, you know, the, the enlightenment and the beginning of science and the coming of our majestic high-tech civilization. So it's supposed to be a story of slow evolution. And in, if you're locked into that idea of how history works, it's very difficult to accept that there could have been something perhaps even higher than us, uh, which was able to do things that we cannot do. Uh, in the remote past. It just, it just, it's, it's an idea that they find very, very hard to accept. So this is the filter. This is the filter through which they view reality. And the effect of a filter is to cut out everything that doesn't fit through the holes. Mm. So that's what they do. They just dismiss the anomalous evidence or find plausible explanations for it which can be, which can be dismissed. Um, and also, um, because academia is a job, it is a structure, um, you, if you want to get a job in that business, you need to buy into its mindset. If you don't buy into its mindset, you actually won't get hired. You won't get moved along. So that, again, there's a filtration process where those who might have wilder or different or extraordinary ideas are just weeded out. Mm -hmm. And you end up with the ones who have bought in totally to the existing mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to mention there, like uh, maybe for, for people that uh, might not know much about the subject, uh, maybe if you could talk about some of the, some of the evidence that sort of supports the case that these there may be more to the story than mainstream historians. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously there's a lot. To there's a, there's a lot there's a lot to talk about. Um, one of the uh, one of the the, the 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 mysteries that really intrigues me uh, is that we have certain maps which have come down to us uh, from from the past. Now, very often, what these maps are are maps that were made in the 14th or 15th or 16th century, but they were copied from older maps, and the map makers themselves tell us this. The famous Piri Reis map, which was actually drawn by a known Turkish admiral in 1513, and which shows Antarctica 300 years before we discovered it, uh, that map, um, Piri Reis states on it in his own handwriting that he based it on more than 100 older maps that he had access to, but which are now lost. And he suggested that those maps had come down to him from the library of Alexandria, that they had been removed from that library before it was burnt in ancient, in ancient times. So the suggestion is that he had access to an archive of maps now lost, which were the, the main features of which were incorporated in the map that he created, and other maps. Uh, the famous map maker Mercator was another who copied from ancient maps, and Orontius Phineas as well. And, and what these maps uh, all have in common is, first of all, fantastically accurate latitudes and longitudes. Now, longitude, I won't go into the technical details, but longitude is something that's very difficult to do. And, and until our culture uh, cracked the problem of longitude by inventing chronometers, watches, clocks that could keep accurate time at sea, our ships were constantly bashing into coastlines that they didn't expect were going to be there because they were too far east or west of where they thought they were. Yeah. Um, so it's really the, 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 the late 1700s that we get the science to begin to make accurate longitudes on maps. And yet in these much older maps, which in turn are based on even older lost maps, yeah. we find spot on accurate longitudes. This is a huge yeah. problem. Yeah. Secondly, we find Antarctica on lots of these maps. And it's just a fact of our history that uh, Western civilization did not discover Antarctica until 1818. Yeah. So what's it doing accurately drawn on a map from 1500 copied from an even older lost map? Is it not also Antarctica underneath the ice? Is and that it's right? underneath yeah. the ice. Yeah, and, 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 and again, some of the maps actually show the subglacial topography of Antarctica yeah. as though those maps were originally made when Antarctica was not ice covered. This is a huge problem for, for history. It's a very difficult problem to, to explain and I've never seen mainstream academics satisfactorily deal with this, uh, with, with this problem. Uh, and and what, what I found, having, having done a great deal of research into this, and, and in fact worked with some mainstream academics, there's a, uh, there's a chap called Glenn Milne at the University of Durham in the north of England. Um, whose team uh, are, are the leading specialists in, in the issue of sea level rise. 
uh, they have a computer program that will show you any coastline around the world as it looked, really as it looked at any time in the last 30,000 years, because at the end of the last ice age, between 20,000 and 12,000 years ago, sea level actually rose by 400 feet. You know, and enormous areas of land were swallowed by the sea. So, so, so the world of 20,000 years ago looked totally different from the world of today. And the alarming thing is, on some of these ancient maps, is that they spot on accurately conform with how we know the coastlines looked 20 or 15,000 years ago. Right. Wow. So again, the suggestion is that, you know, to create those maps, first of all, the technology to uh, have accurate longitudes, and secondly the infrastructure to explore the world, that yeah. they had ships that could, that could explore the entire globe and, and even very difficult to reach places like, uh, like, like Antarctica, uh, and that this may have been as much as 15,000 or more years ago. This is extremely disturbing to the yeah. mainstream view of history. Because, uh, because their view at that period... Is, what, what, is, that, they, is that our ancestors at that time were, that's what's called the Upper Paleolithic, that they were simple uh, Stone Age uh, cavemen who only had stone tools, uh, who were hunter-gatherers, who lived a, a very simple nomadic uh, life with no question of ships, no question of technology of, of any kind. So these maps are a, are a, huge, uh, a huge anomaly. Um, the, uh, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, uh, the last surviving wonder of the ancient world, and indeed the whole majestic complex on the Giza Plateau is, is in itself another piece of in-your-face evidence that is just being ignored at the moment. And again, we have one or two mainstream academics who've come out of the cupboard and said they, ha they actually do have problems with the official dating. And one of those is Professor Robert Schock at the University of Boston, who has looked at the erosion patterns on the body of the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx is supposed to be four and a half thousand years old, 2500 BC, if you accept the mainstream chronology. Yeah. But uh, Schock's work on the erosion patterns suggests that it was exposed at some point in its history to thousands of years of extremely heavy rainfall. Right. And uh, the, you know, the study of paleoclimatology is pretty good these days, and we know that the climate in Giza has been the same as it is now for at least 5,000 years. Right. Um, and that means that the Sphinx has to be a lot older than that. And in fact, you need to go back nine or 10,000 years to what's called the Neolithic subpluvial to get the kind of heavy rains at Giza which could have caused that erosion on the Sphinx. And that only tells us that the Sphinx was already there nine or 10,000 right. years ago. Yeah. Doesn't really say how long it was there before that, yeah. you know, so the Sphinx is a problem. The megalithic temples that stand in front of the Sphinx that were actually created from the blocks that were removed from around the body of the Sphinx to create the body, uh, therefore are of the same age. You have blocks of stone weighing 100 tons each in those temples. Um, and, and then, you know, you come to the, the Great Pyramid itself, uh, which, is, um, which is an astonishing piece of incredibly precise engineering. Uh, and this is the problem because there are really no antecedents for it. There are, Egyptologists are able to cite a few earlier monuments in Egypt which they suggest are part of the evolution. But really, if you look at that with common sense and an open mind, it seems to me that they're talking nonsense. This thing is unbelievably precise. It's not just that it's huge. It's, I mentioned the figures earlier, but it's 481 feet high. I'll repeat them. It has a footprint of 13 acres. It consists of six million blocks of stone and it is aligned to true north within just three sixtieths of a single degree. Yeah. I mean that is almost atomic clock precision on a monument of that scale yeah. uh, and to get that kind of that level of precision on a monument of that scale involves astonishingly advanced architectural techniques. Yeah. Um, and and uh, it doesn't fit at all with the minimal evidence of evolution that Egyptologists are able to, to bring to the table. So again, I can't help feeling something's missing from yeah. the story.